As the Father has loved me, John 15, 9, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Let us pretend that I have more hair, that I am a young Christian, and then I come to you and I say, you know, I see this stuff in the Bible about remaining in God's love. How do you do that? How do you stay in his love? How, how, do, you, how do you go then? Well, <clears throat> difficult question. The chapter started off with a true vine analogy, didn't it? It started off with the big thing for the branches to remain united to the vine, yeah? That's the overarching reality that we're dealing with. But that priority just got an awful lot more specific. Remain in his love. We're to remain in him, yes, of course we are. But specifically, we're to remain in the beam of the spotlight of his love on the world stage. To remain in his love. Now, of course, it's his love that we're to communicate. That's a derived love we're going to need to show. And if we're going to go on showing it, we need to keep soaking it up. So the light needs to fall on us. I remember decades ago being uh, a very young minister uh, in, a, in a minister's gathering where another young minister, now quite famous as it happens, but then just one of the boys who got our sandwiches with, you know, he was asking how we should handle a difficult situation. A problem he had, it was actually troubling him a fair bit. And he, he got up and he said that he preached to his people every week the best he could, but he was in a position where he had to say he was becoming deeply troubled that he didn't really love them. And you could see people around the room thinking, yeah, I know, I know you a lot, I wouldn't, I wouldn't love much either, you know. Um, I was a bit shocked by that. I have to say, I really wasn't in that position at the time at all. And I found what he was saying quite troubling, quite shocking. It stayed with me for nearly 30 years, as you can see. <laughs> and the older the wise in that room that day, they seemed to have nothing useful to say to the poor guy about it. And it wasn't a very helpful morning session. What do you do when the people in your church and people you look at you don't love them very much? <laughs> they, they, they don't seem like that. Somebody should have stood up, stood up and told him this. The love you need to have, the love you need to show the people you serve and love, is not your love. You haven't got it anyway. It is the love that passes like a current along a wire from the Father to the Son, from the Son to you, and from you into the world. Now let's take an analogy, if you like, from atomic physics. Because I knew you'd like to do that. And there's more diagrams like they are. It's a good Do you know... Do you know, something very like that does appear on the, on the, on the, on the intro to the Big Bang Theory of Television. Uh, this is taken from a much more erudite source than that on the internet. Um, and that actually there for you today is a carbon atom. Okay, everybody? It's not the Big Bang Theory. This is a carbon atom. And Cal were having, and I were having a discussion about this in the car as we were driving along the other day, um, about some, some aspects of elemental physics. Uh, and, and in some materials, what you find is, is this, don't you, Cal? You find that their atoms are bound together pretty tightly. The, the uh, electrons going around the outside there in their little orbits around the proton and neutron in the middle. Those, those are flying around there and in some materials those electrons are bound very tightly so they can't leave their orbits. Dark conductors, superconductors and semiconductors? Yes, you can steal my thunder if you wish. Would you like to explain this? I don't mind. Don't start there. Okay. It's not a good place to start. Conductors start with insulators. Insulators. Yes. Don't they trap heat in? Yep, they trap so that the, the electrons can't flow. Some materials, the electrons can pass from this atom to the next one along and they all swap along the line. You go, oh, hello. It's like people visiting one another's house all down the street, isn't it? You know, they pop in next door and the electrons pop into the next atom along and they pop along, pop along, pop along. And as this flow of positively charged electrons is flowing along from one atom to the next, you suddenly have a current, you stick your finger on the end of the wire and you go, ah, okay? Because there's energy flowing down that wire. It's flowing along as it moves from one to the next. Tell me about... That, that, that's uh, we've done insulators, we've done conductors. Tell me about semiconductors. Semiconductors. Uh, semiconductors don't lose a lot of power. Except under certain conditions. Except under certain conditions. They're the ones, yeah? They're a bit choosy, aren't they? They might swap their atoms with you, their electrons with you, but they're going to be choosy about whether they do or not, and when. So, for example, you've got something that, a material like silicon, for example, pure silicon would be there, and its electrons would be able to be passed on, but only if certain conditions were fulfilled. For example, if light falls on it. Some materials, if light falls on them, some materials, if they're warm, things like that. 
you know, like some people, you can only get anything out of them if they walk, can't you? Yeah? Otherwise they're hopeless. Can't do anything at all. So, so some of these materials are like that, semiconductors are like that. They will release their, their electrons into a flow of energy under certain, certain conditions. Insulate this won't let them go. Conductors will easily let them go. The electrons swapping atoms go all down, all down the line. Metals, steel, aluminium, copper. But there are these semiconductors that are more choosy. The silicon in, in solar PV panels looks like this, doesn't it? So when the sun comes on, they're happy to swap electrons, move them along, and you get an electrical current at the end of it. That's how they work. Christians, this verse seems to be saying, are like those semiconductors. So that when the conditions are right, they transmit or conduct the love that flows from the Father to the Son, to his disciples, to the world, bearing fruit to the glory of God the Father. But unless they remain the beam of light that transmits his love from the Father to us and out into the world, then there's no conducting going on at all. The whole process stops. Does that make sense? Is that, is that all right? Yes, Simon. Yes, Simon. <laughs> yes, Simon. You told that, didn't you? See, there you go. Long ago. But only if the conditions are right. So you've got to stay in the love. You have to remain in this love of mine, says Jesus. Stay in the love place. Human analogy is all we've got, isn't it? You know if you're in a relationship, the other person isn't trying, what effect does it have on what goes on? You've got to work at staying in that loving place. Uh, many years ago, you may remember this or not, uh, as the case may be, it popped up in the news recently. But many years ago, I remember having one or two wedding sessions with a particular Anglican vicar. And uh, <clears throat> it's not somebody we've all heard of, by the way. Being a little shocked to learn, in a large, sort of seemed rambling North Oxford house, where they gave plenty of hospitality, and entertained a straight stream of visitors and so on, his wife and he had a little room where nobody went but them. Do you remember that, Vincent? Nobody went there but them. It was their place. That was their place to go and be, just be together. Because, you know, life made demands, semi-public life, and, you know, so that was their place. A place to be together, enjoy one another's company, away from the rest of the world, nobody else came in. And I think he was trying to recommend that we did the same, but in the end he didn't marry us, and we ended off, headed off after our actual wedding, and honeymoon to shack up in a little narrow boat on the canal, there was no little room, was there, dear? There was just this place, and that was it. That was ours. The point he's making was this, uh, he thought it was good for his marriage to have a place deliberately to go, just to be together, to be nice to each other, your place where you want, went to enjoy being together, went to work on your relationship together. Now, now you know, we might perhaps might think he, he might be forgiven for thinking he was pretty much in touch with his feminine side, but actually he was a good guy, and he is a good guy to this day, I'm sure. What he was saying was make time, make space, make a place to build one another's love and relationship. You've got to remain in this love of mind, says Jesus. You've got to remain in this love of mind. That means time set apart with him. It means time invested in your relationship with him. It means trying. It means not counting it as a waste to reflect on and meditate over and enjoy the love of God for me in Christ. To tell myself about it. Because there are plenty who tell me the opposite. It's dodgy to start listening to them. Maybe to talk to others about it, because that kind of builds it too. Others who know about it, as well as you do, or others who have never heard of it yet. Building on, basking in his love. It's not wasted time. <coughs> Let me give you an example, a human one again. I'm on Twitter, as it happens, with a few of those media types. Surprised, then? Eh? Yeah, I thought you might be. And one of them is a young believer, right? A young believing lady who, a few years ago, married her dream man. Got the picture? It's all of it. Fleshy, you know. And within months, this lass was bereaved. Now, it's devastatingly sad, but she still loves him. And uh, actually, she won a, a blogging award a little while ago, a couple of years ago, for, for her blogging around this whole theme of how, as a Christian woman, she comes to terms with the fact she still loves him. And she openly honours his memory with her love, and she tweets and blogs about her path of pilgrimage, really, as she's put her life back together and just walked through it with God. She's become quite an outstanding young Christian woman, in, in my experience, in, in, my, in my view, through that experience. But as she talks about her deceased, believing husband, warmly, longingly, she is so obviously staying in the place of love with her beloved. 
Don't neglect that person, don't turn and walk away from that person, you don't find that person inconvenient or too demanding and strap off. You remain within the focus of their love. So, so what's all this talk about commands then, Jesus? Because that's where he goes next. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. That's odd. That's not our world's view of love described at all, is it? These verses make quite plain that this love relationship is a structured relationship that's getting maintained. It's a structured relationship with structure in it, with order in it. It's not an egalitarian in the sense of unsubmissive relationship that's entailed. There's a submission that goes on. Christ submits to our needs. He submits to the needs of those disciples and takes a towel and tucks it around his waist and off he goes. He submits to our most fundamental human need of salvation from sin and he pays a price that's enormous. And he says, if you obey my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I've obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. If we trust him, if we love him, we submit to his commands. If any of our daughters or young friends or whatever are going off and getting married, what are they doing? They're submitting to a relationship, to a pattern, structured, complementarian relationship where they trust and are loved reciprocally. We trust him and if we love him we submit to his commands. And living out that submissive relationship feeds the love. What commands? Commandments? Oh, yeah. Commandments. If I say two commandments in a in a New Testament context, I say commandments. The Old Testament's not far away, is it? If if I say to you commandments, you think ten, right? Don't you naturally? A lot of the New Testament works like that. Say commandments, they think ten. If you obey my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I've obeyed my Father's commands and remain in His love. What, what's this about? Well, the commandments are what the, the first part. The first part of the Ten Commandments is about loving God, isn't it? Love me, says the first set of commandments. And then the second lot, the first table of the law is about our relationship with God. The second table of the law is about our relationships with one another. Paul talks about that in Romans 13. He says, the commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment they may, may be, are summed up in this one rule, love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilment of this law. What does that say that love is about in our passage in John 15? Exactly the sort of service that, that is in John's context. My command is this, verse 12, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Now, now where is Jesus? Where is Jesus in John 15? Do you remember Colin? In John 15. Uh... Yeah. He's in a room. With his disciples. With his disciples and he's cleaning their feet. He's cleaning their feet. The night before, the night that he's betrayed. For 30, for 30 pieces of silver. Exactly, for 30 pieces of silver. It's good to have the detail. What's about to happen next? He's about to be betrayed. So what's he doing? What's he saying? Where's the Lord set the bar? As I've loved you, so you love one another. No one, greater love has no one than this, but he laid down his life for his friend. It's the love of the Father and the trust of the Son that gives rise to the love that we now know as we remain in his love. And it's not a comfortable option. It's not a comfortable option. This is love. A man lays down his life for his friends. Just hold that thought. Because the point of remaining in his love is that your joy may be complete. That's it. I've told you this, says Jesus, this thing about the cycle of love from the father to the son, from the son to, to, to the adopted brothers, and from the adopted brothers out into the world around to one another and to the world around us. I've told you this, says Jesus, so that my joy may be in you. 
that Jesus is joyful when he sees us and that your joy may be complete. The tragic thing about compassion fatigue, which is where we started, isn't it? Is the joy-killing effect it has on its victims. You're trying to give out love and care and compassion and care all the time and you're on empty. There is a serious, heavy price to pay for compassion, for comparing, for love. And some of us are married, and some of us are parents, and we know that through everything we've been through, it's the love that hurts the most. Because we run out. And who of us hasn't known times when the love isn't just leaking away out of us, but the hole in the dike has become a breach and a flood. It's the love that hurts the most, when that love isn't abundantly supplied and drawn from the great source of the love of the planet. His love is infinite. His love knows no end. His love flows from the nature that is His. God is love. 1 John 4, 7 Dear friends, let us love one another. Ouch. For love comes from God. Ooh. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And this is how God showed His love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through. And what's the point of remaining in this love? The avoidance of compassion fatigue with doing what we know we should and want to. Should and want to do. I told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete.